On this final day of the octave of Easter, we have come to celebrate it also as the feast known as Mercy Sunday. And it is essentially based on the revelations given to St. Faustina, a Polish nun during the Second World War. But when we look upon this devotion, we must not understand it as something new within the mystical body of Christ, but rather a representation of perhaps the oldest devotion in the history of the church. For it is, it is a devotion rooted in that Easter mystery, particularly at the Last Supper, when we find the beloved Apostle St. John resting on the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And indeed, in the image of the Divine Mercy, we see very clearly that it is rooted in the Heart of Jesus, for from the heart flows those signs that are signs of blood and water, symbolizing our baptism and that price that Christ paid his precious blood in order to purchase baptism. And so, when we seek to understand this mystery, especially as it is related to us into today's gospel, we must understand it in that context. It is not a new revelation, but rather the all-encompassing mercy of God represented to us in a way and in a manner that can be readily understood by the people of our times and our age, and most especially the emphasis that God is truly merciful to all those who seek him. And so there are things in today's gospel that become very significant in understanding the profound depths of God's mercy and what it is rooted on. And we must always keep in mind that this devotion first manifested to us at the Last Supper is rooted in that very mystery, the Eucharistic mystery, that is, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And so the Lord begins this mystery by walking through the doors, and he intends by doing so to manifest the almighty power of his Godhead and the gifts conferred upon his glorified body. That is, he is at that moment strengthening the apostles and all the disciples, and in doing so, he not only comforts us, but he also wishes to comfort us so that no earthly power so that we fear no earthly power, for we know full well it is in the mystery of the resurrection that we learn earthly powers have no control over us, no matter how fearful their torments may be. What the Lord is simply doing here is fulfilling that which he said in the gospel, Come to me, all you that labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you. And even if it were to cost us the agonizing torments that our Lord himself underwent, he says if we come to him, we need not fear. And in coming to him, what is he referring to? What can refresh us? We know very clearly from the Easter mystery, it was not that coming manifested by St. Mary Magdalene, although certainly well-intentioned, but the very reason the Lord tells St. Mary not to touch her is because she has not come to understood that deep mystery by which we are to touch the Lord, that is, the Eucharistic mystery, or more properly, the Eucharistic miracle in which Christ perpetuates his presence amongst us until the end of time in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And so in the Eucharist, we truly touch the Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity, not a symbol, not an image, but a reality. And indeed, the objection to this mystery can always be summed up in the same way. It is said by those who do not understand it or those who ultimately reject it that it violates the principle of contradiction. That is, something cannot both be and not be at the same time and in the same place and in the same respect. But the Eucharistic miracle does not even violate this natural precept for the Eucharistic miracle is never present in the same place. And that can be readily under sh shown when we realize what place means. For place means our relationship to something else. And so the raising of the hand changes the place of everyone in the room. And so in the ciborium, each presence, each 
in the ciborium, each host is in a different place. It is not the multiplication of the body of Christ in the sense that there are hundreds and thousands of bodies, but it is the same body, the same body that rose from the dead, merely in a different place. And so there is no contradiction in the Eucharistic miracle, even of this precept, and God who wrote the laws of nature himself does not violate it. And so he seeks first and foremost to strengthen those apostles in this reality, this reality in which the first reading would call, became known amongst the early Christians as the breaking of the bread. And it is that which it is primarily referred to. For very early we see clearly that the Eucharistic sacrifice becomes the center and core of the Christian life. This is most strikingly present to us on the Feast of the Pentecost, for it is manifested by all the doctors and fathers that the first Pentecost was not merely a prayer gathering, but, but rather the Eucharistic sacrifice. And shortly after the moment of consecration, it is then that the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles. And so it is clearly a mystery that they came to understand and ultimately that we must understand in light of the apostolic re revelation. And so our Lord tells us very clearly that that which is required of us to truly understand and comprehend the power of this mystery is that we must close our minds and our hearts to the world and to the flesh, recognizing that we struggle against human frailty and human carelessness and that there is always one who is about seeking always to destroy this memory in the hearts of men. But we must understand in remembering this mystery, it is not merely a memory, but the Eucharist is a reality, a reality that will go on until the end of time. And our Lord will ultimately emphasize this union we must have with the apostolic church when it says after he comes again to Thomas that he stood in their midst. Here, the absence of Thomas is most significant. St. Bernard would have us to understand, you are deceived, Thomas, in hoping to see the Lord when separated from the company of the apostles. The truth takes no pleasure in places apart. He takes no pleasure. He takes pleasure in common discipline, common life, common studies, or as we say in the creed, he takes pleasure in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And she is the safeguard and the dispenser of all that is merciful, all that is truly merciful, because it is rooted in that apostolic faith. Indeed, that is exactly what St. Luke is describing to us in today's first reading, that common fellowship of the one true faith. And so we cannot hope to find the mercy of God separated from Holy Mother Church. That is the significance. And Father John Harding of Happy Memory defines mercy as the disposition to be kind and forgiven, founded on compassion, founded on compassion, mercy differs from compassion or the feeling of sympathy in putting this feeling into practice with a readiness to assist. It is therefore the ready willingness to help anyone in need, especially in need of pardon or reconciliation. And there was no one more willing to help mankind in his need than the Son of God, the very creator of mankind. He would offer that sacred humanity in order that we may receive pardon and forgiveness of our sins. And so the Lord emphasizes these two sacraments in today's gospel as the very means by which we acquire his mercy, the sacrament of the Eucharist and the sacrament of penance. Penance is that sacrament instituted by Jesus Christ to remit sins committed after our baptism. And it is instituted by our Lord on this very day when he gives the apostles the power and the authority to forgive sins, to bind what they believe is to be bind, bound and to loose what they believe is to be loosed. And it is very significant that our Lord in conferring this power to the apostles chooses his very breath to signify it. 
For the smoke of sin fogs the mind and the heart, but it is the breath of the Holy Spirit that dissipates the smoke of sin and the wiles of the devil. It helps expose to us all that he tries to do in order to keep us and all souls from the divine mercy. And so, ultimately, there is no difference in the divine mercy devotion, no difference whatsoever in that fi- than in that final command of our Lord, what is mercy? Mercy is to go forth and preach the gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, that is, incorporating them into the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. For as many of the saints point out, it is better to be a sinner within the mystical body of Christ than a sinner without. For outside of her is the wailing and the gnashing of teeth, but inside of her is the forgiveness of our sins. And so it is this this divine mercy that we first and foremost must seek for ourselves and in seeking it for ourselves in gratitude to the Lord who has done all things, we must strive to bring it to all peoples and to all nations so that they truly may have their sins forgiven. By the flowing waters of baptism, we have been first claimed for Christ. And if we have fallen into mortal sin after our baptism, Christ has not abandoned us. He has established that sacrament of his mercy of which St. Alphonsus de Liguori points out that it is almost inevitable if one to reach the age of adulthood outside of the mystical body of Christ, not to fall into some mortal sin. And he asks the question, can God forgive sin of those outside the mystical body of Christ? He answers, certainly all things are possible with God. But then he points out, it is one of those things that is possible in theory. But then he points out, if a member of the mystical body can never be certain of making a perfect act of contrition, What of those who are not members of the mystical body? And as G. K. Chesterton would point out, that ultimately it was not the intellectual argument for the existence of the church or any of the philosophical arguments that convinced him to become a Catholic. It was as he declared, it was only there that I was certain my sins would be forgiven for attrition, not perfect contrition, but attrition suffices in the sacrament of God's mercy, that is, the sacrament of penance. And that is why it is important for each and every one of us to truly never abandon the mission of the church, to bring this truth to all souls, to present it as the Lord expects it to be presented, that there is no sin that the Lord is unwilling to forgive. Indeed, all the doctors and the fathers who speak on the matter point out, for those who would fall to the temptation of Satan to despair, was the Lord, when he said to, when he said to Judas, wouldst thou, friend, wouldst thou betray me with a kiss? If we attribute to the Lord sarcasm, then we have, as one of the doctors and fathers pointed out, committed at best a sacrilege, for we have attributed Judas's condemnation to an act of cruelty. And so there was no sarcasm. And Monsignor Eugene Cavan would point out, it is necessary to understand the Hebrew language to understand what transpired at that fatal moment. When the Lord, as it were, asked that question of Judas, he was telling Judas, There is no need to expose your sin publicly. He was simply asking him, Judas, do not go forward with the kiss and you will receive my forgiveness. He would have given him absolution at that moment and Judas would not have abandoned the apostolic college. And so, everywhere and always, the Lord sought to brought mercy, except in those rare instances when the soul showed itself to be so hardened that the Lord, despite his efforts, or as the image points out, he comes towards us, he does not force himself on us. He came towards the Pharisees and the scribes each and every moment of his public life. They became so hardened, as St. John Chrysostom points out, that they would not accept God's mercy. And so the Lord, on rare occasion, would point out that that is why you die in your sins. 
not because of lack of effort on my part, but because of lack of effort on your part. When I come towards you, you run away. And the Lord cannot force himself upon us. He cannot penetrate into our free will. He can only beg and plead that we accept it. And so let us strive always and everywhere to accept this gift of the divine mercy so that we as members of the apostolic church can truly become instruments to the whole world to bring that mercy to all souls, to all times, and to all places so that no one ever will hear those faithful words of condemnation at the end of time, but that all may experience the mercy of God because they have come to have complete confidence in what the Lord illustrates today. Fear not, for in incorporating myself, incorporating you into myself as my mystical body, there is no earthly power, and that includes Satan, who has authority over you. He can do to you what he did to me. He can do to you what I permitted him to do to my servant Job, but he cannot destroy the soul. He can ravage the body, and if it is accepted in resignation to the will of God, it only becomes an instrument of his destruction and the driving out of his influence upon all society. And so let us strive always and everywhere to show we are true members of the mystical body of Christ by accepting the penances, the trials, and the tribulations we are asked to bear in union with our Lord so that we truly may always live in the divine mercy that is in the love of the sacred heart of Jesus, the fountain of true life and of true love, a mystery that is always ancient and always new. And so the Lord throughout history with St. Margaret Mary Alacoque and St. Faustina has, if we were to use the modern expression, I guess we say he tweaks it a little bit in order that our ignorant society may understand it, that this society that seeks the riches of this world may come to understand what the Lord has said. What doth it profit us if we are to gain the whole world and suffer the loss of our souls in the process? Why strive for the world when the very thing every soul is called to acquire is the vision of God for all eternity? And so we have complete confidence in his mercy for in his resurrection, he has truly proven and put the exclamation point on it that death no longer has any victory, death no longer has any sting. And all those who are incorporated into his body will travel by way of the crucifixion, but with one exception, their corpse will not lie rotting in the dust without a purpose. They will lie that way knowing that at one time they were placed in the arms of the mother of God like the Christ child, and it is only that body that rises again. And so, while corruption will set in on each and every one of us, it will not be the final arbiter, for God very clearly has the power and the will to restore all things. Or as one Franciscan would point out, when this doctrine of the resurrection at a conference was being questioned and a certain sarcastic remark was made. Well, it says, one pointed out, that in the scripture, that in hell, there'll be the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. And it was pointed out by a modernist theologian, how can that be, for it is quite obviously, some have had no teeth in this life. An old Franciscan stood up and simply quipped, Oh, don't worry, teeth will be provided. And so, if the Lord will provide teeth for those who have not had recourse to his mercy, we know full well that he will provide all things for us. And so, it is important that we not fear giving up what the Lord asks us to give up, ultimately, our lives in this world, so that we can take it up anew in the world to come.